Thank, thank you all for coming out. It's lovely outside, isn't it? Yes. I guess it gets a little hot around here. I, uh, it's a little cold today, a little cold for you? Yeah. yeah all right. Well, I'm from Seattle, so I, I, my wife just called as I was finding. I, just so you, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, the maps on the other side of campus don't have this building on it. So it makes it, makes it tricky to find. It's a little Harry Potter thing going on. Um, I was like, the invisible building. So I, I went and turned myself into the police and they took care of me. That's what my mother always said. If you're lost, go find a policeman. And, and so the, the nice policeman uh, gave me the directions. Um, yeah, so I've been, uh, uh, um, she said, uh, Kate, Sarah said, was that Sarah? No, who, who introduced me? Angie. Angie. She said, oh, uh, was a New York Times bestseller. I have to call you on that. Uh, we, uh, it's, we're on the list. This week we clocked in at 23 on the New York Times bestseller list. So now it's been four and a half years on the New York Times bestseller list, which is nice. <clears throat> it's also available in, uh, in the Reader's Digest edition in Croatia. So if you have any uh, relatives in the old country with short attention spans, they too can read The Art of Racing in the Rain. Um, it's, it's quite a thing when that happens. Uh, the book initially came out in, uh, I think it was May or June uh, 2008 as a hardcover. So it's been, we're coming up on our, our fifth anniversary. And I love talking about Enzo. Enzo is very near and dear to my heart and he's uh, assured me that uh, my, my kids' uh, college educations will be paid for. And that's very generous of him. I really appreciate that. But sometimes, I want to read something a little different. And since I'm doing two events today, I don't know if any of you are coming tonight, um, I'm going to read something different. I know you're probably going to be mad at me, but it's okay. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. Uh, I'm going to read a short story uh, that that's, you have not read. And, um, and then we'll just do Q&A, and then you know, I can tell you all about, the art. we can all talk all about the art of racing in the rain. I could even read some from the art of racing in the rain, for just for my own selfish purposes, I'd like to read something a little bit different. So, this is, uh, I wrote this, it was commissioned by uh, Humanities Washington, which is an arts organization, arts and humanities organization uh, in the Northwest. And uh, it was for an event, uh, a fundraising event, and we were asked, several writers were asked to write a story on a theme, and the theme was night flight. So I live in a neighborhood of Seattle um, called Seward Park, or near Seward Park, it's called Mount Baker, is specifically where I live. There's a big park there uh, that is Seward Park, and it's, it's the last inner city old growth forest probably in the world. It's, it's, it's old, old timber, it's, it's been beautifully preserved on this little peninsula. And uh, it's awfully weird because I was reading a, a, mag a newspaper article once and it was about uh, these parrots, these feral parrots who live in Seward Park. And so I, I had that as my idea for night flight. And so this is what I came up with. <clears throat> By the way, just so you know, I don't know what you guys are like around here. Is there a fault line around here somewhere? Yeah, okay. We are petrified, petrified in Seattle, that the big, the big one's coming. And, uh, and yet we, we don't do anything about it, so. Hold on one second. Have you bolted your house to its foundation yet? Oh, the title of this is The, the Peculiar Intelligence of Parrots. Have you bolted your house to its foundation yet? I mean, look at the maps, read the reports. The Cascadia subduc subduction zone is due for a 9.0 magnitude quake within the next 50 years. A catastrophic quake resulting in liquefaction of soil. Shear damage will be extreme, resulting in the severing of communications, electric, gas, water, and all utilities. Liquefaction, you know what that means. The ground on which you're standing turns into something resembling water. Not cool. I repeat, have you bolted your house to its foundation yet? Yeah, neither of my parents. They haven't stocked three days worth of water either, three gallons per person per day. They haven't packed a suitcase with extra clothes, set aside a flashlight and batteries, bought a battery-operated radio, stockpiled any cash, topped off their gas tanks. I repeat, have you bolted your... Ah, oh, forget it. You never listen. My dad had this line he thought was really funny. If he and my mom were fighting, not an unusual occurrence, he would say, every other weekend, two weeks over the summer, and Christmases in odd-numbered years. He would pause and then deliver his punchline. 
Those are the times you can come stay with me in my condo in West Seattle when the divorce is finalized. It was a joke, of course. He was making light of their fighting, and by so doing, he felt he was diffusing my ap apprehension about the state of their miserable relationship. Like, we might be fighting, but we will never get divorced because we love each other so much. That's funny, right? Ha. Huh. But then one weekend, I found myself sitting in my divorced dad's condo in West Seattle, and I realized that sometimes when people make jokes, they're actually foretelling the future. Like Cassandra, who I learned about in a mythology unit we did in school, she could tell the future, but no one would believe her. Imagine you could tell the, tell the future, but you didn't even believe yourself. That's my dad, the shape of an L on his forehead. <laughs> my name is Trevor, and I live in Seattle near Seward Park, and I'm in the sixth grade. I have a little brother who's kind of cool. His name is Joseph Benjamin, so we call him Joby. He's only five, which means my parents didn't have sex very often, like, <laughs> like once every seven years or so, which is part of the reason my dad is living in West Seattle, and my mom is dating her Pilates instructor. I'm pretty much in charge of Joby because my mother isn't really good at the whole mother thing, her words. So I've become a really good cook. Frozen waffles, pop tarts, hot dogs, basically anything you can shove into a toaster oven or a microwave. So one afternoon when all the responsible adults were away, I put a couple of frozen burritos in the micro for Joby and me and I turned on the TV, the local news, so I could check the weather. And there was this feature item about a whole bunch of parrots living in Seward Park, for real. Wild parrots. They'd escaped or been liberated or something. A huge gang of feral parrots living in Seward Park, maybe 200 of them, and they're really smart. Scientists figured that people just let them go because parrots squawk a lot, so people probably get sick of them and set them free. Not a big market for secondhand parrots on, on Craigslist. So when the burritos were ready, I wrapped them up in paper towels, put Joby in his chariot, and took him down, down to the park to look for them. Seward Park has some of the last old growth forest in the whole world, so it's sort of a deep, rich forest with a ton of poison oak, or at least a ton of poison oak signs, which keeps people away and makes it a safe haven for feral parrots. Joby and I went up the hill and into the woods, and the city faded away. Except for airplanes, we couldn't hear anything man-made, not even the I-90 bridge. Joby saw the first one. It looked like a dirty bird from a distance, dark and scruffy with a long tail, but it had a distinctive curved beak and a round head and upright stance. And when I looked at it, I was mesmerized. A parrot in Seward Park. I looked around and realized the trees were full of them, old gray, old gray parrots. I shouldn't say that, they might not have been very old, but they were definitely gray. That comes from malnutrition, apparently. Polly, want a cracker? I asked, and I took out a box of Ritz crackers and tossed one of them high into the air. None of them budged, not even a blink. I tried again, nothing. Polly, want a peanut, I asked. This time I fired a whole roasted, unsalted peanut at one parrot's head, and I swear to God that parrot reached out with its foot and snatched the peanut out of the sky, looked at it, cracked it open with its sharp beak, and ate the nuts right out of it. Then he looked at me, right at me, wondering if I might have more. Oh, I had more. I fired another peanut at the same parrot and got the same result, and soon Joby and I were covered with parrots. I think it was good that my parents got divorced because they didn't like each other. But I also think it wasn't so good because they didn't like themselves either. At least when they were together, they had something in common. When they broke up, they became lonely and self-destructive. But who am I to judge? Joby and I looked after each other that summer since my mom was either working with Jake, the Pilates instructor, and my dad was either working or rollerblading down to Alki Point so he could look at the girls. So Joby and I started spending a lot of time with the parrots. They got to know us pretty quickly and seemed to be uh, expecting us whenever we arrived. We figured them out too, which ones were the peanut freaks, which pre preferred no salt baldy pretzels, and which liked goldfish crackers. They all liked raisins and dried mangoes. After we started having lunch with them every day, we noticed the color started coming back into their feathers, so maybe we were doing something good for the universe. In any event, we went to Seward Park every day that summer, except the weekends we spent in West Seattle with my dad, and on those days, we felt really bad about not feeding our friends. Honestly, we grew pretty attached to them. They were the most dependable friends we'd ever had. Parrots don't talk, they imitate. They can sound like they're talking, but they don't really form sentences. They're kind of like Xerox machines made out of feathers and blood. <laughs> but apparently, they read. And one day, when Joby and I went to visit our friends for lunch, they brought a whole bunch of newspapers for us to see, which I didn't think was totally weird at first. They collected them, I figured. I mean, they live in a busy park in the middle of a city. People leave their papers around, the parrots steal them, you know, whatever. And I might have thought it was random, the papers they brought us that day, except they were all from different months and even different years, and they all featured one of three things. A story about earthquake probability, a story about hot air balloons, 
or advertisements for rubber rafts. <laughs> what do you think, I asked Joby as we studied the papers, though Joby just looked at the pictures since he couldn't read. He said, an earthquake's coming. They want us to get ready. I love Joby, five years old, and he plays the piano like a crazy sick piano genius. I'm serious. Not like a kid who's been taking lessons for years and can play some Chopin etude that's been pounded into his head by a $40 an hour piano teacher. Joby, who has never taken a piano lesson in his life, can hear a song on the radio and then sit at an empty piano at a shopping mall or a school auditorium or some, fr some friend's house where my mother has dumped us for the weekend so she could go to an ashram with her boyfriend because my dad refused to take us because it wasn't on his schedule. Joby can sit down and play that song beautifully, straight out of his head, like bang. He can freaking play some Elton John song or Billy Joel. And sure, it's corny like New York State of Mind, but he can play it so good, it makes you cry. I swear to God, that's what pisses me off about all this. Joby should be famous. He should be on America's Got Talent or something. He shouldn't be lost to anonymity and mediocrity because his parents are losers. Did I tell you about the L on my mother's forehead? It's bigger than my father's. Look, I'm busy. I'm in sixth grade. I've got tons of work to do all the time, and my parents are screw-ups. So while I was impressed by the newspaper collection presented to me by the feral parrots of Seward Park, and while I was moved by my brother's assessment of those articles, I guess, like any adult figure, I ignored the signs. It was a few weeks after the newspaper incident that the next strange thing happened. My dad was bringing us home from West Seattle one morning, and he stopped abruptly in the middle of 32nd, 31st Avenue. A family of five raccoons was crossing the street, not panicked, not rushing, just trotting across the street. I've never seen raccoons in the day before, I said to my dad. Neither have I, he admitted. They're probably rabid. Stay away from them. But they didn't look rabid. And then that night, Jake, the Pilates instructor, told me to take out the compost, so I hauled the stinky bag up the stairs to the compost bin in the back alley, and I saw a coyote run by. Really, a coyote. What are the odds? Seward Park, raccoons, coyotes, parrots bringing newspapers. I'm no genius, but I'm not a either. I got myself ready. A blow-up raft and foot pump, 200 feet of nylon rope cut into five-foot lengths, lightweight extendable paddle, five bags of roasted unsalted peanuts, $79 of accumulated cash gifts excluding coins, too heavy. My dad's fire wand grill lighter, a survival radio my uncle Lester gave me before he vanished mysteriously, possibly a Jewish mafia kill, my dad says. Water purification tablets I got with my mom's REI dividend because she never uses it. Water bottles for me and Joby. Jalapeno beef jerky I shoplifted from the Leshai market because it's so good, but I always felt guilty about it, so I never ate it. Underwear and socks for me and Joby. That's what's in my earthquake preparedness kit. What's in yours? My mother was over at Jake's house when it started. She said I was big enough to watch Joby, and I should call her if anything went wrong. Jake lived on Beacon Hill, so she wasn't far away, and probably nothing serious would happen. And don't answer the door, and don't answer the phone, but if I need anything, call her and she'd be over in a minute. If you've never been in one, let me tell you, it's scarier, scarier than you can even imagine. It starts as sort of a deep rumble, a deep ocean wave, but the ocean is the ground, and the dogs start barking right away, and then the car alarms go off, and it's like a cacophony of sound. But when the shaking doesn't stop right away, and grows into an earth dance, and when you can picture those tectonic plates, huge, massive in scale, ramming against each other 20 miles below the ground, you realize how tiny you are compared to what's happening. Just like in mythology, titans are clashing, and you, you're a speck on one of their swords. When the electricity goes out, and the dogs are so afraid they've stopped howling, but the wave is still going, even though you've counted to 20 a bunch of times, that's when it gets really scary, when it keeps going beyond that. The first thing I do is make sure I'm alive, and I am. So the next thing I do is make sure Joby is alive, and he is, and that's very good. Our entire house, not bolted to the foundation by the way, has slid down the hill and is resting neatly in the street. It is night, there is no power. Car alarms are going off everywhere. There are no sirens. I picture all the ambulances, police cars, and fire trucks buried in rubble. There are only car alarms. That's a comfort. When I become the new president of the universe, I will have all car alarm designers put to death. Joby is pretty good on his bicycle, but I don't know what we'll encounter, encounter on our journey. So I hook his chariot up to my bike and pull it with our survival stuff and wheel us out onto the street. The world is full of people in pajamas. They're all standing out of their houses, or what's left of their houses, as many are in rubble. They're scratching their bleeding heads. Some of them are screaming in pain, but the ones who are not in pain are silent, like zombies. 
silent staring witnesses to absolute and total destruction. Mount Baker Park is a hole in the ground, maybe 50 feet down. All the houses on the hill are destroyed, and the world smells of natural gas, and there is a terrible sucking sound, like the earth is taking one long, deep, wet breath. I pedal as fast as I can down Lake Washington Boulevard, which, strangely, is mostly intact. Fault lines, you never know what they'll, t what they'll tear up. Fallen trees litter the ground all around us. The world is devoid of electric lights, but full of lights from fires that have ignited from gas lines and house fires. We snake, away, snake our way through the carnage. Are you okay? I call back to Joby, and I turn to look. He's in his bicycle stroller, scared to death. We'll be okay, I reassure him, though I'm not so sure myself. Here's my logic. Beacon Hill, after a quake like that, is now Beacon Mound. Georgetown is the new waterfront. Soto is a deep water bay, so no one is coming to help me and Joby. We have to help ourselves. We make it to Seward Park, which has become an island, an eventuality that I have anticipated. I blow up our little raft with a foot pump and paddle us over to Seward Island. We can see the stuff. We can see stuff because the moon is out and the city is raging with fire. We get to the island and haul the raft up onto the shore. I tie the lengths of nylon rope to the safety rope that circles the, the raft. I don't know if it's going to work, but those parrots were trying to tell us something when they brought us those newspapers. An earthquake balloon boat. I grab a handful of peanuts and throw them high into the air. Paul, you want a peanut? I yell. And they appear. They hesitate, lurking in the trees, but I can see them. They don't take the peanuts. They're just as afraid as we are. We'll find some place, I, I tell them, with trees and peanuts and dried mangoes. We'll take you there. I take the end of one of the ropes and put it in my mouth, and then I flap my arms. God, I hope this works. I'm pretty sure it will. After all, it was their idea. One of them lands near me and grabs a rope with his talons and lifts into the air. Okay, so talons are better than beaks. Whatever works. 39 other parrots join in. Joby and I climb into the boat, and they start flapping like mad, and suddenly we're flying. Parrots are exceptionally smart. They are also exceptionally strong flyers. They take turns on the ropes, doing a neat little rotation, so we always have about 100 birds flying around us, 40 of them doing the lifting. We fly through the night air at about 300 feet, hovering over the carnage that was Seattle. And it is carnage. Our bird raft circles north a bit over the lake, and we see right away that both floating bridges are gone. We cross over the Mount Baker Ridge and get a view of downtown, which is half the downtown that it used, that it used to be, if that. Everything is glowing orange from fires, and things, fires, and things aren't glowing, uh, things that aren't, I'm sorry, every, that's a bad sentence, I should rewrite that. Every, <laughs> Everything is glowing orange from the fires, and the things that aren't glowing are black with flooded water. Yeah. Puget Sound seems to have surged very high, maybe a tsunami. Harbor Island and Soto are submerged and have become a new tidal flat. West Seattle is isolated because the bridge has collapsed. I wonder where our dad is. I wonder about our mom. But there is no room on our bird raft for them anyway. I point the birds south, and we follow I-5 as we fly along. Everything is dark, the entire coast, it seems. I have no idea how extensive the damage is or how far ranging the quake. I turn the crank generator on my little survival radio and tune for a station, but I only get static. Finally, I get a weak signal. Ah, oh, the devastation is absolute. There's nothing left. The entire west coast has fallen into the sea. If anyone can hear us, please help. Please, we need help. We continue flying through the night with no known destination and just the kindness of a ragtag group of feral parrots to depend on. Joby looks up at me. When are we going to get there? He asks. I don't have the heart to tell him. <clears throat> excuse me. I don't have the heart to tell him I'm not sure there's even a there to get to. Soon, Joby, I say. We'll get there real soon. So there's my short story. I was thinking of possibly f continuing with it. We'll see what happens. I have a couple of... I'm trying to finish up my new book now, and I have another one I want to write. Who knows? Maybe one day I can just see these guys going around the country and, and this kid playing piano in bars, you know, for tips and stuff like that. <laughs> uh, my little five-year-old five brother who, who's a piano genius. So that's... Uh, uh, that was kind of fun, right? It wasn't... Didn't, didn't, didn't suck, right? Um, so, but we're here about the art of racing in the rain. Um, uh, I can read some from that and all that, but do, does it, do you want to just go to Q&A or do you want me to ask the questions for you. You guys should ask them. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions about the art of racing in the rain or about the in peculiar intelligence of parrots? <laughs> Sir. I hope I'm not the only one. Uh, uh, can you tell us a bit, please, about 
your agent, your relationship with your agent, how you came to have that relationship, how you chose him or her, or vice versa, yes. and, and what that agent does for you. Okay, so you, th this, that, okay, so here's the problem. This is why I'm a novelist and I don't write haikus, because that, I can answer that for about 20 minutes, and I'm going to. I'm going to take 20 minutes to answer that, because I'm going to, everyone's read the, the book, or many of you have read the book? All right. So there's a kind of a famous story about how the book came to be published, which has very much to do with the agent I'm working with now. And I'm going to tell you that story, even though some of you may have run across it before on the internet or something. But still, it's a f very funny story. I grew up in Seattle. I uh, um, moved to New York. I went to school in New York, and I lived in New York for 18 years, and then moved back to Seattle in 2001. While I was uh, living in uh, New York, I made documentary films. And at some point, a film came across my desk. Uh, a friend of mine had asked me to take a look at it. They were looking for a US distributor. It was made in Mongolia, this film. And uh, it was about this really neat idea that there's a belief among the nomadic people of Mongolia that the next incarnation for their dog will be as a person. So it was kind of this cool idea. And I watched this film, it was very lovely, called State of Dogs. And uh, I, I didn't get involved with it for a number of reasons, but uh, it stuck with me, this idea that maybe our dogs would come back as people and we would know that. We would be able to talk to them and have a two-way, two a dialogue instead of a monologue with our dogs because they never seem to answer whenever we ask them questions. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know how to tell the story. So I just kind of tucked it in the back of my head. So years later, in 2006, I was at a poetry reading in Seattle uh, and the poet Billy Collins was there. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Billy Collins. He's a terrific poet. He was the Poet Laureate. Um, a number of years ago, and he's really great. His poems are very funny, they're very accessible, and there's always a nice poignant twist. He was reading one of his poems that night called The Revenant, which means words from the dead. And so it's told from the point of view of a dog who's recently been euthanized. So it's, it's being narrated from doggy heaven. So uh, the first line of the poem is this. I am the dog you put to sleep, as you like to call the needle of oblivion. Come back to tell you this simple thing. I never liked you. <laughs> It's very funny. The dog is, the dog is very uh, bitter about his previous life. And there's a, again, there's a nice twist at the end. It's a great poem. It's in a collection called The Trouble with Poetry. I encourage you to check out Billy Collins' work. Um, if you ever get a chance to see him live, you really should go because he's a, a terrific entertainer. Uh, while I was listening to him read this uh, poem, and everyone was laughing in this audience, I was like, oh, wait, 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 that's it. Remember that story about the dog being reincarnated? There's only one way to tell that story. That's why I couldn't figure out. The only way to tell that story is from the dog's point of view. A dog who is convinced he's the smartest person in the room. He's just not a person. He's in the wrong body. He's been trapped in this. He doesn't have tongue. He can't, no one listens to him. He can't open doors. This is my dog. So <clears throat> this was uh, this epiphany that I had. I, I, I was very excited about it. And, and I went home to because I, really, I wanted to get going on this story. Now this was, in, as I said, the summer of 2006. At the time, my, uh, I was doing a lot of touring for my second book, uh, How Evan Broke His Head and Other Secrets, which had, done, had gotten some nice reviews and won a couple of awards, but it wasn't, it wasn't selling well at all. So I was doing the thing that, that uh, un, un, unread writers always do. I had a box full of, a trunk full of books, and I would drive around to all the bookstores in the Northwest doing readings for two or three or sometimes zero people. And, uh, and trying to develop a relationship with the, the bookseller. When, when writers do this kind of stuff, it's, it's not just about uh, an audience, theoretically. I mean, no one wants to do a reading. Let me just tell you, a re doing a reading for one person is the worst. You would think doing a reading for zero is the worst? No, because if it's zero, the, the bookseller usually says, oh, they feel bad for you, and they close up the store, and you go have a beer. So at least like, you have a friend. <laughs> But I'm telling you, I once flew all the way to Plano, Texas to do a reading for one person. And I was like, I'm like, let's just have a little, let's have a chat. And he's like, no, no, I want the reading. I came for the reading, I want the reading. I had to do a reading for one guy. And I was like, dude, you're killing me here. <laughs> so I was doing a lot of traveling that summer, going from bookstore to bookstore to bookstore. And um, at some point, my wife pulled me aside and she said, I know what you're doing. I know why you're doing it. You're going to these bookstores and these libraries because you're developing a relationship with them. And I, she said, I understand the importance of it. But you know, it kind of shifts the burden on me because you know, she said, I, I'm staying home with the kids all the time that you're gone and you're off driving all over the place. And I, I'm not even convinced. What do you do all day? 
I see your readings at night, but what do you do all day? I, I think you're going to see the movies. <laughs> well, it turns out she found a ticket stub in my pocket. <laughs> Because that's exactly what I was doing. I would go, my kids were, how old were they? You know, like say seven and nine, for instance. So they don't go see R-rated movies. So I could go, go for a little jog by the river, whatever town I was in, because all towns have a river. I could get a little light lunch at the Subway sandwich place. I could go to the movie theater, see an R-rated movie, then go out and do my reading at night, and then pack up my car and drive off to the next town. It was, it was a pretty cushy life. <laughs> at that point, my wife started giving me page counts. She said, no, you need to be writing your next book. So take your laptop, and when you go away, I want to see pages when you get back. You can write in your motel room. And, uh, and so at this point, I, I have to introduce you to my wife. Um, she's, she's not here. She's at home taking care of the kids. <laughs> but I have to introduce you to the concept of my wife. Um, any writer will tell you, uh, your, your, your spouse, your, your partner is everything. Um, most important person in your life. My wife is my first reader. She's my most dependable reader. She's my most honest reader. She is usually my most critical reader. Um, she is everything, and she really, uh, I, I dare say she's my muse. She inspires me to great things. But you know, before we get all gooey on the muse thing, she's not like one of those muses like with the angel wings and all that, and the, <laughs> you know, hovers up in the corner and sprinkling pixie dust on my keyboard. She's much more of sort of like a, well, kind of like a Fifty Shades of Grey dominatrix muse. <laughs> you know, she really cracks the whip. Get back in that room and don't come out until your chapter is finished. That kind of, really good for inspiration. So, so this was the summer of 2006. I had this idea for the dog book and I went to my wife. I said, I'm going down to Central Oregon to do some readings for about four days and I want to start this new idea. I want to start this new dog book. And she said what any good dominatrix muse would say. She said, no. Absolutely not. That's not the way it works. She said, you, well, you finish the book you're working on, and then uh, it gets published. We make a little money, and then you can write your dog book. Think of it as a carrot, she said. You look forward to it. I said, it's a really good idea, though, and I begged and I pleaded, and finally she relented. And she said, okay, fine. You want to start the dog book? Go ahead. But I want to see 40 pages when you get back. So I went down to Bend, Oregon. I checked into the Riverside Lodge. Lift, opened up my laptop and I said, doggy, you better be ready. And the first sentence came to me, gestures are all that I have. Sometimes they must be grand in nature. And I thought, ah, oh, I've got it. I wrote and I wrote and I wrote. Uh, four months later, faster than I'd ever written before, I had finished the first draft of The Art of Racing in the Rain. I was really excited about it. I sent it off to my agent in New York, waited patiently for him to call. He took a couple weeks, finally he called me. It was the Tuesday before Thanksgiving in 2006. I know this for a fact because Certain things just get emblazoned in your brain, in your memory. It was the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. My in-laws, who are from New York, uh, were coming out to visit for the first time. Uh, not, they, they'd come to visit. They were coming for the first holiday. So they were coming out for Thanksgiving. I was a little bit nervous. We were doing a big Thanksgiving feast with them and my parents. And, and I had to prove, I do all the Thanksgiving cooking, so I was going to try and make a really special dinner. And I wanted to prove to them that I moved their daughter and grandchildren from New York to Seattle, that they were flourishing in this environment and they were happy and they weren't living, you know, I didn't have them locked in a closet or something to keep them in Seattle. They actually loved it and wanted to stay. So I was really nervous about that and I was walking to go get my turkey at the grocery store and my cell phone rang and it was my agent. And I said, uh, oh great, this is great, because now he's gonna tell me how brilliant I am, more evidence that I can give to my in-laws. <laughs> and so I answered my phone and I said, uh, what do you think? And he said to me, it's narrated by a dog. I said, that's right, I, I know that. I, I wrote it. I said, but what did you think of the book? And he said, I can't sell a book narrated by a dog. No one will read a book narrated by a dog. No one will buy a book narrated by a dog. No publishing house would know how to publish a book narrated by a dog. It's not even narrated by a dog. He said, it's narrated by an author pretending to be a dog. To which I said, Victor Hugo wasn't a hunchback. <laughs> he didn't get that joke, I don't think. Or maybe he didn't hear it, I don't know, but he just kept on going, he just glossed on over it, and, and he just went on and on and on at great length about uh, the state of the industry and how no one was buying fiction, about how this was a very important book in my career, about how I was now ruining my career, and worse, I was taking him down with me. So he ended up his, his, uh, his diatribe with a, a statement just saying, please, 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 do us both a favor, throw this book away, and go write me something I can sell. 
And I don't know what got into me. Maybe it was because of the holidays and all that. I was feeling very festive. These two words popped into my head and I couldn't stop myself from saying them. I just said to him, you're fired. So I fired my, my agent. Now let me give you a little bit of advice. Any of you writers out there. If you're working on your third novel, and your first two novels, you know, you got like nice reviews and stuff, people liked it, but geez, they didn't sell a whole lot of copies. And let's say you're working on your third book and it's told from an alternative point of view, like, like a dog, for instance. And let's say you're gonna get in a fight with your agent over this alternative point of view and you're gonna fire your agent and it's the Tuesday before Thanksgiving when your in-laws are flying into town that day for a great big Thanksgiving feast. It's best not to tell your spouse about that until after Thanksgiving. <laughs> I think you get the picture. It was a little tense around our house. Still, my wife was always very supportive, so we got through it, and I immediately started trying to find a new agent. And I sent it out to everybody, and I just kept on hearing the same thing. Love the idea, love the writing, it's all great, but it's narrated by a dog. No one no knows how to handle this book. No one can touch this, no one will publish this book. I was getting really frustrated. In March of 2007, I was at a fundraiser for King County Library Systems, our big system up there in Seattle. And uh, they do a big literary feast where they have 35 writers and 35 tables. And it's a, it's a lot of fun. And I, I, went to, I was at the pre-author dinner that year. Uh, they feed all the writers ahead of time. And I was with a bunch of other writers and we were going around the table introducing ourselves. It came to me, I said, hi, my name is Garth. And I'm really frustrated because I have this book and I think it's really good, but it's narrated by a dog and no agent will touch it. And this other writer sitting across from me looked up from his plate and he said, oh, hey, you should call my agent. You know, he sold my book and it's narrated by a crow. Yeah. <laughs> I don't see why he couldn't sell the book narrated by a dog. And this is a true story. His name is Lane Mayhew. He wrote a book called Song of the Crow about a crow who stows away on Noah's Ark. So I said, I got the guy's information. I got the agent's information and I, I sent him my pages and he called me two days later and uh, he was crying. He said, I, he was reading the book right there. He's like, I'm reading this now and I love this dog and I love this story. You have to let me represent this book. I know I can sell it. And he had some really great ideas uh, uh, for a couple of structure things that we, we worked on together for a little bit. And then 50 weeks after I started writing it on July 17th in 2006, he sent it out to all the publishing houses and there was a little bit of what they call an auction. And the next thing you know, he made a great big deal um, with Harper, which, who's a wonderful publisher, been a wonderful publisher. And uh, since then, as we know, it's uh, been four and a half years on the New York Times and it's now in 34 languages and it's being made into a film with Patrick Dempsey as Denny. So just to prove the moral of the story, people will read a dog book. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's a, uh, I think the moral of the story is really more to the point. Whenever I do community reads or, or I go visit places, I, I always like to work when I can. When it works out, I'd like to work with, uh, maybe visit a high school and, and meet with some students. Because I think it's important uh, for them to understand that there's a lot of changes that are gonna be happening, especially high school students. There's so much potential and it's all very exciting. And everybody, everybody knows what's best. I have, my oldest kid is 16. I know exactly what it's like. He, everybody knows what's best for him. You know, his, his parents, his brothers, his grandmother, his, his Uncle Bob, the school counselor, his favorite teachers. Oh, you should do this and you should do that. You should go to this school and you should blah, 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 blah. And I think it's important for kids to realize that's all well and good and that's nice and nod and be polite. But there's only one person who has to do it and that's you. So if it doesn't ring true in your heart, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. And it would have been easy for me to put the book aside because this agent said, don't do it. But uh, I really felt there was something there. And sometimes you have to stand up and say, no, no, you're wrong, I'm gonna take a chance here, even though it's a little bit risky. Uh, and I think that's an important thing for, for kids, so that's why I like telling that story um, to them. So that kind of answers, that's my agent. See, I told you I'd get back to the question. I have a great relationship with him. Uh, Jeff Kleinman is his name, he's a wonderful guy. Uh, he's a little bit crazy. Um, he, he lives in rural Virginia. And, and has, a, has a duck hut and takes care of ducks. <laughs> he's, he's awfully weird, um, but his wife is a veterinarian and so she cares for the ducks too, I guess. So, and then last night he called me uh, at 11 o'clock this time and he's two hours ahead. I'm like, what are you doing awake? He's like, oh God, I'm working. What do you think I'm doing? I'm like, why are you working at one o'clock in the morning? He's like, I have all these books I have to read. I'm an agent. So he's, he's always working, he's a very nice guy. But, so there's my agent answer. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Do you have a publicist and who is it? 
I do. The way the world works in uh, traditional publishing, is it, you, can you hear me if I'm not using this? Yes. Okay. Better, Oh, okay, good. Well, I just I didn't want to uh, not take advantage of it if it, if, it, uh, if it would be good to take advantage of it. Um, in the world of traditional publishing, um, the way the system kind of works is if you, your publishing house assigns you a, a, a marketing, two different people, one marketing and one PR, there is a difference, marketing and publicity. Um, and basically you work for a window of three or four months, uh, depending on the book and depending on how well it's selling and depending on where they classify you in the hierarchy of the, the slate of books that they're publishing. Um, in the old days, uh, uh, not even in the old days, in the day, now, that's fine for some authors. Um, a good friend of mine is Eric Larson. Do you guys, Eric Larson, Devil in the White City and his latest uh, In the Garden of Beasts. Well, a wonderful guy, a good friend of mine. He, he has a different approach. I mean, he, he just goes with that. He's like, look, I go out there, I write my book, I go on tour, I do my tour, and I'm done. He would never do what I'm doing, is now four and a half years after the book is out, still going out for the book. Um, maybe he doesn't enjoy it as much as I do. Um, maybe that's just not the way his mind works. I have my own personal publicist. Uh, her name is Dawn Stewart. Um, and she works out of Bend, Oregon, which is, and you can work anywhere these days with this kind of stuff with, you know, the internet. Um, she always wants me to do more and more and more and more and more. She pushes me to do more. Uh, I, I'm now at the, t at the point of, I, I'm gonna be retiring from Enzo. Um, <laughs> because I'm, I'm finishing up my new book and I want to get it polished up and really devote myself to it, I take a little bit of a break and then get on the road for that. So uh, it is important for writers, for authors nowadays to be very self, uh, promote yourselves quite a bit. Uh, there's a lot of avenues with social media, as you know. Nothing quite like having the Pope tweeting from his helicopter. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, does he have a Blackberry or is he using an iPhone? I'm just wondering. And do you get that for free? I mean, is that... Is that considered a bribe if Apple gives him an iPhone? How does it? You know? Oh, yes. I thought maybe you had the answer. You know, I can make up My question is when you translate a book into a movie, did you write the screenplay? How much involvement do you have in turning a book like Racing in the Rain into a movie so that it will be true to what you wrote? Uh, okay, that's, the, that's a good question. <laughs> it's a good question. And, and, and there, there are differing philosophies on it. And when this, my book was optioned um, by Dempsey and then Universal Studios set it up, um, I had a philosophy which is, I don't really want to have anything to do with it. Tom Wolfe, the famous writer Tom Wolfe once said, uh, you should never have anything to do with your book being made into a film. Because as soon as you have something to do with it, uh, oh, if you don't have anything to do with it, you can always, if it's a great film, you can take all the credit. And if it's a terrible film, you can point to it and say, look what they did to my book. But as soon as you have anything to do with it, it's all your fault. Everything, you get blamed for everything. So he said, really just stay away from it. And I tried to take a page, that page from his, from his book uh, and be hands off. Also understanding that they were trying to make a really big movie, so therefore there's a lot of money involved and they want to use their people, their Hollywood people. And I understand that. I also understand that to translate a book into a movie, especially a book that has, is narrated by a dog, you have to change stuff. I, I get that. I would not want to change things. You might as well ask me to translate it into a haiku. Uh, you know, it, it's just, I, I wrote this. I, I, this is what it is. So I wouldn't want to cut anything out or alter anything. So that would be weird for me. Now then, time has passed. Uh, I, they've had gone through a couple of screenwriters. Um, the first screenwriter, uh, they sent me the screenplay uh, that he wrote, and uh, I read the first couple of pages, and I, I, I put it down, and I, I said, I, I can't even look. And so my wife picked it up, and uh, when I was away at my office, and I came home that night, and she had torn it up into little teeny pieces and lit it on fire in the bathtub. <laughs> that wasn't even the most bizarre thing. She also then took a, a smudge of sage and lit it, lit it and walked around the house waving it in the rooms to clear the evil spirits that the script had brought into our house. I mean, this is how, I said, I don't even want, I don't even want. So then they ended up 
they ended up going in a different, they got this other guy in there. So then they, hired, they got rid of that guy and brought in a new screenwriter. Now this book, I, did you guys like it? Did he like it? Yeah. Okay, so like, like literally, I'm not, I'm not saying this for my own, literally millions of people have read this book and, and love this book. There's one person in the United States who has read this book and hated it, and they hired him to write the screenplay. <laughs> I don't get it. I, 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 there was, there's no humor. There's no Enzo's POV. I, 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 the Denny character, I was like, no, 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 no. The, the point is that Denny is, when Eve is sick, Denny does everything right. He's, he's, he's working harder to make everything right. He doesn't not know how to make lunch for Zoe. He's not incompetent. He's not a boob who then learns how to be a good father. No, 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 no. So he don't even, so now they're working with another screenwriter. So we will see. We'll see. I am, I am not, I'm cautious. I am not cautiously optimistic. I'm just cautious. And then they, just do they can do whatever they want. Will, and you have no say from now on. That's right. But you see, I have a loud mouth. <laughs> and they don't want me going around like what I'm doing right now. See, they, they'd prefer I didn't do that. So I'm really excited. I think they're going to make a fabulous film. It's going to be terrific. <laughs> you got that? You got that on TV? <laughs> can you go back and like edit out that other stuff? <laughs> we'll see. We'll see what's going to happen. Something's going to be happening soon. Uh, I don't want to go into great detail about it. There's going to be something exciting I know is going to happen. Yes. Yes, ma'am. I love your book. Thank you. There was another book that was narrated by Cujo, that's, that's Stephen King? Long time ago. That was narrated by the dog? I, I really? I, I'm, I, you know, well, maybe you're right. I didn't read it. I saw the movie. It was scary. Yeah. The movie, it did not translate very well into a movie. Hmm. I quite enjoyed the book as opposed to the movie. Um, let's keep your fingers crossed. Uh, this on your book. Yeah. I, 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 here's the thing. There's, there there's going to be an opportunity there very likely will be an opportunity that I will become much more involved in the film and that it's sort of like the sequester thing. March 30th is the day that they're going to make that decision. Um, a theater company in Seattle uh, called Book It Repertory Theater may, translated it into a play last year. Uh, Book It Rep does this really cool, uh, their adaptations are wonderful. They, they do, it's not really a full dramatization, uh, it, it's acted out, but parts of it are recited by the cast. So it's really, it's really neat. They do a terrific job. Um, and they did mine last year. And it was awesome. I mean, it was like boggling. Uh, you laugh, you cry. They, 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 there's this guy, an actor, uh, who played um, David S. Hogan, who played Enzo. And he was a guy on his hands and knees. And, but he would talk to the audience. And then he would be involved. And then he would talk to the audience. And, he was fantastic. I, I went to one of the, I went to, I saw it a few times because I was so amazed by it. And I, I, I was, one time I was sitting next to this guy and he was just shaking his head, man. He was like, before the play started, he was looking at the program and his wife had brought him or something. He didn't want to be there. You could clearly tell. He was probably like, there's a, there's a good Mariners game on TV right now and I'm missing it. And he's looking, and he's going, no, no, no. And so finally I just leaned over. I said, listen, the lights are going to come up. There's going to be a guy climbing around on the furniture with his hands and knees, pretending to be a dog, and you're going to think, there's just no way. I promise you, by the end of this play, you're going to believe that is a dog. And because that's how good this guy was. And by the end, the guy looked at me and he was like, how did he do that? How did this actor, in, you know? So it can be done, but it's going to take some, a new a creativity, a, a creative way of looking at it. And maybe a director who's a little bit wacky, um, like Spike Jones or something, you know, who did that wonderful movie, Being John Malkovich. Did you see that movie a bunch of years ago? Yeah. Terrific. I mean, unfortunately, he's destroyed his career because he then did that huge budget ultra flop of where the wild things are. So no one wants to work with him. I'd work with him. I think he'd be great because you have to have the POV. If you don't have the POV of Enzo, it's just another family drama that we've kind of seen before. After, next, yes. Yeah. Different. How did you find, or how did they find, someone to be able to translate it and still keep the, the story going, flowing? 
Being that I only read English, I have no idea. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how good the translations are. That's not, that's, uh, I know that my acupuncturist told me that the simplified Chinese translation is better than the complex Chinese. It, it, uh, so the question is, uh, how, how do you know what, what happens with the translation? You really don't. Um, I, with my first book, with Raven Stole the Moon, um, I knew enough high school, it got translated in only into two languages at, when it came, first came out, into German and into Italian. And I knew enough high school German and enough college Italian that I could kind of poke through it and see. The, the Italians did it just verbatim, you could tell. The uh, Germans uh, took out uh, bad language, they took out any hint, any whiff of sex, and they took out my comment about um, the Mies van der Rohe Barcelona chair. I don't know why. Why, why? Mies van der Rohe, I, and that's their thing, okay. Uh, I don't know, there's no way for me to validate uh, whether or not the, they sell, sure. Um, the deal was with the international editions, uh, it was a big hit in Spain. Basically, Formula One countries loved it. It was a big hit in Brazil. In fact, Vivienne Senna, uh, Mar uh, Ayrton Senna's sister, wrote an introduction for it, which was very cool. Uh, it was a big hit in, in all through um, uh, Indonesia and uh, Japan, uh, China, huge in China, uh, all the sort of Pacific area down there. Um, uh, Germany, big bestseller in Germany. Italy, big bestseller. Um, Northern, Italy, Northern Europe, nothing, hated it, they didn't like it. So Finland and uh, Norway and uh, all those countries, eh, they, didn't, they didn't care. And uh, in France, they, they, didn't, they didn't like it, but everybody read it in French, loved it, but the publisher didn't like it, I guess, so they just kind of went out of print and died, unfortunately. Yes, ma'am. Have you ever done any racing yourself? Have I done racing? is the question. Yes, I have done racing. I've raced, I raced for about four years with Sports Car Club of America, SCCA. Uh, I raced a spec Miata. Had a lot of fun doing it. Um, met a lot of wonderful people. Any of you who have done racing, you know that people really do speak like that on the racetrack. You know, your car goes where your eyes go. Uh, that's the, one of the first things they teach you, in fact, when you get your license, is your car goes where your eyes go, you know. And then you say, well, yes, why are you telling me that? Well, when you're, when you're going out for the your first race, you're all amped up because you've never done it before, and maybe, uh, it's like you're already nervous enough, right? And so all the cars are lined up on pre-grid, so they're all less lined up end to end, uh, side by side. And then the way a race goes is when they're ready to get the cars out onto the track, the pole, guy in the pole position gets to choose which lane he wants to be in, inside or outside. They go two by two. So he, it's his choice, or her choice, depending on who's doing the pole. So you don't know that until the very last second. So your pole, uh, sitter uh, says, I want the inside. Okay. So then the f corner workers, they wear all white so that you won't hit them. <laughs> and you can see them easily. And they have usually orange gloves. And uh, they, all the cars line up and then they send you out for your pace lap. And so there's a person who stands in between the two lanes and the, your cars come at him or her single file and that person's job is to tell you where your lane is. Because if you're like 34th, you don't, know where the, you don't know what lane you're supposed to be in. So it's all single file, and then someone looks at you and they point, they point to you, and then they point that way. And then they point to the next car, and they point that way. So that everyone knows where to go, right? So what they teach you, your first race, the steward, the steward is the boss. Steward comes over to your car and says, novice race, right? Yep, novice race. He says, okay, so here's what's gonna happen. The, the corner worker is gonna point and it's gonna point. When he or she does that, stop looking at him or her. Look to where you're supposed to go. Because you know how many times that person gets run over? <laughs> because you're busy looking, and the person goes like this, and you're like, yeah, yeah, right, 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 bam! So it's very important to see, and then look over here, so okay, I'm going that way. So, uh, but anyway, uh, so I did a lot of racing, had a lot of fun doing it, and if you're ever, uh, get a chance to be on the track, you should do it. Uh, you should check out Bob Bondurant, only three hours away. 
has a terrific program just south of Phoenix. Sir, you've been patient. You might want to explain PRB to probably some people here that, that don't know that. The, the, the point of view. The point of view? Oh, the concept or the point of view of this book? I don't think many people know the acronym. Oh, POV, point of view. Does everyone know that? POV means point of view. That's easy. Now the real question. Yes. Now, did, did the other, your prior two books, to the Art of Racing, book, yes. uh, did they do well following the success of Yes, they did well. My, wh what became of my other books? Um, my first book, Ravis Stole the Moon, had been, uh, had gone out of print. And uh, so the first thing we did is uh, reissue it. Harper bought the rights. Uh, for me, they had revert, rights had reverted. What happens is if your book is out of print for a certain amount of time, you get a letter of reversion from your publisher giving you back the rights so you can sell them again if you want to. Um, I called up my initial publisher, which was Pocket Books, and I said, hey, you know, this new book is going to be a big deal. You might want to put my book back out in print. And, and my editor said, no, we don't. I was like, all right, well, give me the rights back. She said, all right. And then she got in big trouble. So, yeah. Yeah, her, I had to sit down with her boss at some point. And he's like, I never would have allowed that to happen. Anyway, uh, so w it came back into print. You know, they sell nicely. Uh, they've had kind of a second life, but it's not, nothing's compared to The Art of Racing in the Rain. I mean, it's, it's crazy. And the other one? Uh, How Evan Broke His Head and Other Secrets has done, uh, again, it's done very well for it. Uh, it's, it was published by Soho Press, which is a small press out of New York, so their expectations were pretty, uh, you know, modest. Um, but uh, they're very happy with it. And they, they kept the rights and they, they wanted to exploit it. And, and they're, actually, they're actually repackaging it. They think that maybe they get change the cover a little bit. They can, uh, they can get even more sales. So, yes, ma'am. How do you travel about the country? How do I travel? Yes. You mean like horseback or bicycle or something? <laughs> No, 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 no motorhome. No, I, I, uh, I use airplanes. Um, you know, I don't like changing planes. I have this weird thing about changing planes, especially if it's in Atlanta. This is like really weird trivia stuff. Okay, I'll tell you, I'll give you trivia stuff. Uh, so I drove down, I was in uh, uh, Scottsdale last night and I drove, I didn't take a little plane. I could have flown here, right? It's, but I like to drive and uh, it's kind of a weird drive. I'm used to driving. I mean, I drive from Seattle to Portland is the same number of miles, but it's, it's a much more uh, um, active drive because <laughs> there are actually cars on the road and occasionally there's a turn. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Tell us about your new book. Tell us about my new book. Uh, sure. I, I, ha I have a couple of titles, so I, I can't give you a title. I'm not sure what the title is going to be yet. Um, it's taken me a long time to write it, um, it because it's got a lot of layers to it. In fact, it started out as a play. This is the play that I wrote in 2005 called Brother Jones. Um, it was about this logging family, this lumber family uh, uh, in this old, decrepit, haunted house in this very dysfunctional family and uh, a lot of stuff, a lot of baggage. And it may or may not have been haunted, the house. And I said, when I was coming up, thinking about what book am I going to write next, I thought, you know, I really was interested in those characters. Uh, the thing about drama is, a the with drama, I mean, by theater, the thing about theater is that the, it's all about what's taking place right here and now. It's the drama that ha unfolds on stage between characters. That's what gives it the energy. What you can do with a novel is unwrap that and unfold it so that you find the origins of all the now of the drama. You can trace all the history of it. So I said, I want to do that with this story. So I'm going to take the story of the now, and I'm going to trace back this family and see where it came from. And I started tracing back and tracing back and tracing. I got five generations back. And uh, it just, it's, it's, it became a huge, huge story that spanned 130 years and um, goes from Portland, Oregon to Aberdeen, Washington to Seattle and got all this stuff in it. And, um, and I wrote all that. And it took me like three years. And I was like, this big, humongous, 150,000 word manuscript. And, and I gave it to my editor and she didn't like it. 
I said, really? She's like, no, it's kind of boring. I'm like, oh, huh. And so I read over it again, and I tried to change it. I tried to rewrite it, parts of it, and uh, it made it horrible. And so then my wife read some of it, and she's like, why are you screwing with it? E either go with what you have or, or just going to have to do something else. And I said, I think I'm going to have to do something else. But the same story. What I've just done is spent three years doing background research. I did a lot of pre-writing, and I didn't know I was doing it. I thought I was writing a book, but I really wasn't. So now I've been rewriting it for the past eight or nine months, maybe eight months, um, from a whole different perspective. Uh, but it's got all, it's all informed by all this background history. So it's all being told in the now. And it's about a 14 year old kid whose life is coming apart, basically. His parents are on the verge of divorce and they're, they're separated right now. And his father, who's always been kind of a messed up guy, um, just always kind of, uh, you know, the strum the drang of things, you know. He, he uh, takes his son to this old mansion on the bluff overlooking Puget Sound um, to, to meet this kid's grandfather, who the kid has never met, and his aunt, who he's never met. And so they go there, and the kid basically spends the summer exploring this house that was built by this lumber tycoon a hundred years ago, and he starts unraveling all the back history and realizes that it really is haunted. And then it, it is, does become a ghost story, and it's about how do we uh, resolve the problems that we're going through now. We have to go trace the origin. We have to come to terms with our own history if we're going to be able to move forward. And so it, it's this sort of a, there's a spiritual element and a ghost element. It's not gonna be like, there's nothing, no ghost jumping out. It's not gonna be spooky. There's a little bit of creepy stuff in there, but uh, it, it's, it's really been writing, I've been writing, it's been, it's been writing well. It's been going well. So I'm very excited about it and uh, hope to be done in the next couple of months and, 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 and polish it up and, and get it out there in, you know, in a year, year and a half. It's been a long road. But, you, you know, like I say when I teach writing, we're, we're building mountains here. We're not building molehills. It, it, sometimes it takes time. And uh, if you rush it, then you're just compromising uh, the product. And I, I can't do that. It takes a lot of effort for someone to read a book. You know, it takes time. It takes attention. You got you to gotta, you put your, your effort into that. You can't read a book while you're washing the dishes. You know, you can, you can watch American Idol while you're washing the dishes, but you can't read a book. You know, if you, put, if you are watching TV and it's a movie and you get up because you want to get a snack out of the refrigerator, you come back five minutes later, guess what? The movie's five minutes further along. You put your book down to go make a snack, you come back five minutes later, you're still where you were. It's, a active, it's an activity. It's, it's nothing passive about it. And so if I'm going to ask you or my readers to put that time and energy and effort into reading it, it better be good. It's not fair. It's not fair to ask someone to read something that's not the best thing it could possibly be, right? So you have to be patient, but yeah. How do you prepare for the information that you give? Like what kind of research do you do? What kind of, um, to, to be able to talk about a subject? Yeah. Hmm. So a question about research. I'm really horrible with research. I, um, if, I could, if I was good at research, I would have been a nonfiction writer. Um, I basically have this weird thing where I make things up, and then I, I go and uh, do research later, if anybody cares. I can get into trouble with that. Um, with, my, with Yard of Racing in the Rain, um, there's a scene in there where uh, Enzo's talking about the philosophy of race car driving, and he quotes a famous race car driver, uh, Julian Sabellarosa, uh, who said, who's quoted as saying, um, uh, when I am driving, when I'm racing, my mind and my body are working so closely together, I must be sure not to think or else I will make a mistake. So when I was writing that, that chapter, I had all these ideas and, okay, I want this. And I said, I want this quote to be something like this. Uh, and I want it to be a, a real quote, but I don't have time. I'm not going to stop right now and go find somebody who said something like this. So I'll just fill it in later. So <laughs> I, I put this quote down and attributed it to this guy. And then I, I kept writing and so when the, in the publish, publication process, you know, your editor works with you on the story and stuff. And then when it finally gets up to the point of, okay, now we're done, it goes to the copy editor and the proofreader, proofreader for, for mistakes. But then a copy editor is more for grammar and for consistency, uh, you know, you using just too many times, you know, weird things like that. And they send you like this 15 or 20 page 
breakdown of all the way you use words and things. It's, it's kind of fascinating, although weird. And so I got my notes from the proofread from the copy editor, and uh, she said uh, she got to this this one chapter, and she said. I'm flummoxed by this. You have a quote here by uh, the, the world champion race car driver, Julian Sibella Rosa. I can't find evidence of this guy anywhere. Can you please tell me what races he's won? <laughs> and I said, well, that's gonna be really hard because Julian is my, Julian is my seven-year-old nephew. He doesn't drive. <laughs> I just thought it'd be funny to put him in the book. And I said, by the way, it's fiction. And she's like, oh, right, 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 right. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Right. <laughs> so in my book, sometimes I have real stuff and sometimes I have fake stuff. There's also a reference to uh, a guy named Kevin Finnerty York who uh, won the Luxembourg Grand Prix in 1986 uh, with his, a broken gearbox, uh, only he only had two gears and he finished the, the last 15 laps of the race with only two gears and he still was successful. And this is a big symbol for Enzo. It means, I think his quote is, um, the, uh, the, the physicality of our world is only a limit, uh, the physicality of our world is only a limit to us if we allow it to be. Some, I don't remember the exact quote. I, great moment, all that, and sort of my, the, the copy editor sends in saying, I, I, she says, my records show that they did not run a Grand Prix of Luxembourg in 1986. <laughs> it's true, they didn't. That's deliberately why I did it. I've gotten at least six emails from racing fans saying they didn't run a Luxembourg Grand Prix in 1986, <laughs> 1985 and 1987, but not in 86. I said, that's right, I made it up. There are, if you look in your record books, you'll also see Kevin Finner to York is not, he never won a non-existent race anyway. He's a friend of mine. He's an amateur race car, semi-pro race car driver. <laughs> And uh, actually somewhat of the basis of Denny in that he worked at a, an auto shop that I take my car to and stuff. So um, it's fiction, man. Lighten up, everybody. Sheesh. Who picked the picture? Who picked the picture? This doesn't match my mental comprehension okay. of what ends up. You're one of those. Okay. <laughs> the question is of, of the dog, of the dog on the cover. So as you know, that the hard cover has... A sleek dog. That that dog was supposed to be. Uh, this dog is supposed to be. Uh, supposed to make it look like a car in a wind tunnel. Didn't didn't work, did it? You know, when the designer told me that a year after the book had been out, I was like, really? Is that is that why we did that? So when it came time for the paperback, they said, let's. Um, we want the dog to be looking out. Uh, it'd be more appealing. And so they got this dog, this kind of dachshund dog, and they put it on the cover and they said, what do you think? And I said, that's terrible, absolutely terrible. And so they kept looking at the publishing house, they kept looking, and they couldn't find anything. And so then my wife, as you know, uh, takes things into her own hands whenever possible. She went on the internet and she went on Flickr and started looking at dog photos and found a photo of this dog um, that a young woman in uh, Denver, Colorado, who is an aspiring photographer, she's just starting her business of doing uh, photographs and she was taking photos of her friends and her friends' kids and her friends' dogs and stuff. And there was this great picture of this dog looking over the side of a bed and had these almost human-like eyes and, and this look that was like, really cool. So we got that picture, I sent it into the publisher, I said, find a dog like this. And so they spent a couple of months looking for a dog like that and they're like, we give up, we can't find that dog. And I said, why don't you just use that dog? And they're like, oh yeah. <laughs> So they called up the photographer, and we used that. That's Buddy. Buddy lives in Denver, Colorado. He's come to a couple of readings of mine. He's a big, he, that's when he was a puppy. He's a big grown up now. Um, so that's, where, that's who that is. There's a different cover. If you go to my website, you can see the international covers. Um, they all have different dogs. Not all, but most have different dogs. Um, and it's, a re it's reflective of the culture. In France, there's like a black and white uh, um, like Springer Spaniel or something with a little toy Ferrari balanced on his nose. And in England, it's, a, it's sort of this sad little pathetic dog and you know, woo. And then in, in um, uh, let's see, in, it's a frisky dog in, in, uh, in Finland. And uh, in, in the Czech Republic, it's a kind of a big black Eastern Bloc kind of dog. So it's kind of cool the way people, and the idea was that Enzo is every dog, and I deliberately left his description fairly vague. There's a little bit of a description in there if you pay attention. His mother was a lab, we know that, and he's, he always says, I'm half water dog on my mother's side. Uh, and his uh, father, well, Enzo doesn't know who his father is. 
But do any of us know who our father is? I mean, do we really know? There's that guy who was standing around in the kitchen drinking coffee when we were a little kid. But are you sure that's your father? Have you checked the DNA? You see? So I wanted to bring a little bit of that into it. So uh, he, he believes he was sired by an Airedale. Um, uh, my, the family dog when I was a kid growing up was an Airedale. That's why. That's a nod to, to Muggs. The book is dedicated to Muggs. Muggs was an Airedale. So I, I put that in for, for my father who was, claims that the only worthwhile dog on the planet is an Airedale. And with one exception, my dog. Yes? Yeah, the question is about Enzo's personality and how it changed. It really did. It's, it start, I mean, if I go back and look at my early notes after I'd seen that Billy Collins thing, Enzo was more like the Billy Collins dog, very bitter about being stuck in this body um, and kind of a little more, more resentful and edgier. And as I wrote it, uh, I got to know Enzo, I realized that really wasn't Enzo. Enzo isn't, he's, he's frustrated, but the, the the fun part of his character is that he's, he's kind of a classic double bind. He's, he's got two things that he wants and they're mutually exclusive. So he wants, he's convinced he's gonna be reincarnated as a person. He wants to hurry up and, and yeah, get there so he can get his hands and get his, get his tongue. He's just dying for that, give me that tongue. And, uh, but at the same time, he loves his family so much he doesn't wanna leave them. So he's kind of conflicted like that. And out of that, I found a lot of the, 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 uh, the humor could come out of and, and sort of a lot of his more philosophical moments. So that really does exist, you know, this, the belief. Uh, it's real. The, the film that Enzo sees in, in, the, in the book is, is the film that I saw, State of Dogs. Um, it was, uh, I was going to say something about that. Oh, forget it. Oh, no, so this is how, oh, because this is where some of the humor, this is where some of the serendipity of writing comes from. I was talking about this with someone last night. It's very interesting, you know, art and craft and this sort of stuff, like accidental things that happen. So there are a couple of like fun accidental things. I, so I wanted Enzo to be reincarnated. He, he, he wants to be reincarnated because he's convinced that he's going to be a person. I said, well, okay, so this is a problem for me as a writer because I have to, have, I've got to make that plausible. How on earth does Enzo know he's going to be reincarnated as a dog? I mean, as a person, how on earth would he know that? It's not, I can't believe that dogs have this as inherent knowledge. I can't go with that. There's got to be something. I said, well, what if he saw it in a movie? What if he saw the movie that I saw? And then he said, oh, yeah, hey, I knew there was something different about me. Look. And I said, that's cool. That will work. But I have to, why on earth would, ends, would a dog be watching a movie? And I said, well, you know, when our dog was a puppy, we used to leave the a radio on for her. And we'd, we'd leave, you know, my kids would put on like a pop station or something. And I was like, oh, no, 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 You can't, no, Lindsay Lohan is not where my dog needs to be, no. So I would, I would like go and change the channel to NPR because I, I wanted her to be educated properly. <laughs> and so I thought, well, what if, what if, what if Denny does that? What if, what if Enzo's master leaves the TV on for him? And though they always like to watch racing, he wants his dog to have a well-rounded education. So he, as a joke, kind of, he leaves it on a different channel every day. Then one day on the National Geographic channel, I, get, I said, that's great. That, that solves, right? That just solves all my narrative problems. Now it's convincing. It sounds somewhat plausible, even though a dog watching movies is kind of weird. And then I said, but what happens though? What are the, what's the outcome of this? What are the, what are the corollaries to this? Well, if you were uh, growing up and you hardly ever got to leave the house. And when you did leave the house, uh, some person who didn't understand any, a word you said uh, kept you on a leash at all times, and you always had to be accompanied. And when you got home, you learned everything about the systems of the world around you, uh, including all natural phenomena from the television and from commercials. What would you be like? You'd have a little bit of a twisted view, wouldn't you? And so then I started playing with that whole idea of Enzo uh, believing so hard in certain things, but being completely wrong. The whole thing about the, the monkey thumbs and all that, you know, the, the, the dogs are, are evolved from, the people are evolved from dogs and not monkeys. Uh, I, he convinced me, but 
it, it's quite plausible, but the, you know, I, so I wanted to have a lot of fun with that, and so a lot of humor comes out of that, and that's the stuff that, that just because of, I made one decision, a whole lot of dominoes fall. And sometimes young writers uh, uh, don't pinch themselves off, and, and they won't explore enough of a situation freely, um, because we're busy trying to do something. We've got a thing in our head, we're trying to do something. And it's good that you're trying to do something, but you have to understand that uh, sometimes things are coming from a place that you don't understand. Uh, maybe it's in your subconscious or something. I don't know. Uh, I tend to believe it's in, I get a little bit wacky and spiritual about writing. You know, I, I pretty much believe that there is a soul of Enzo out there somewhere, and, and he was working with me, um, that there is some integrity to this character uh, that's beyond just uh, on the written on, words on the page. Um, but you know that's just that's just the way I work. In a sense, when I'm writing a character, when that when stuff like that starts to happen, then I know that I've woken that character up. So I get close. I, I can shove stuff around, but until that character starts shoving me around, um, it's, I'm not really there. And so I, I always say to, uh, to people when I'm teaching writing, it's my belief that the first draft of anything you write is about you. Go ahead. That's your idea. Your 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 plan, you have something you want to do, go for it. Every subsequent, every subsequent draft is not about you at all. Now it's, your, now it's your duty to be servitor to your character and your story. Because these things must be true. You've, you've set it in motion, but now you've got to straighten it out so that you are not contriving to do things because you had a really good idea. It's not about your ideas anymore. And if you need to change your characters a little bit or change something that happens to kind of get closer to what you wanted, okay, but you can't just force a character to do something that it's not in that character's nature to do. Because if you do that, or if you do it with your story, with your plot line, have you ever, how many people have read a book that you get you two thirds of the way through and you're loving it, you're like, this is fantastic, and then something happens that you don't quite, you're like, what? No, that, really? And then you kind of go, and you read a few more pages, maybe a couple more chapters, and you're going, no, it went wrong and you set it down and you don't read it. Well, that was the author trying to force those characters in that story to do something that was against the nature of those, that character, of those characters in that story. And we can't do that. We must be, pay service to our stories. I think, am I getting a high sign? Okay. Okay, yes ma'am. Yeah, uh, I, I, I am not that narcissistic, so I don't, but yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> I am narcissistic, trust me. But yes, yeah, it is, it is available as a book on tape. <laughs> no, I'm telling you, when I was getting ready to go on this trip, I was had my bag, I was going out the back door, gave my wife a peck on the cheek, and she says, she looks at me, she shakes her head, she's like, don't you ever get tired of talking about yourself? <laughs> and I thought about it for a second, and I said, should I? <laughs> Sir? Do you have a vision for yourself over the, the rest of your life as a writer? Do you have a vision of the body of work that you want Do to I have a vision of the body of work that, uh, of myself? I mean, no. No, I don't think, I mean, I have a vision that, that goes out about, you know, two years. I have my, the book that I want to do, that I'm finishing now, and I have a really, I think it's going to be a crazy awesome idea for my next book. Oh boy. And it's going to drive my publisher and my agent crazy. Because they're going to look at me again and be like, what happened to the dog? <laughs> but I swore to them, I said to them, I said, listen, people, there's a rule the Authors Guild of the Universe has announced, one dog book per author per life. <laughs> and I've used mine up. So I'm not, yeah, no, no, it's just, uh, uh, so my vision, is, it's interesting, people will say, I'll tell them about my new book or my first two books, they'll be, oh, so it's, it's completely different. And I say, no, actually it's, it's not different at all. I mean, the, the, what I believe is similar about all my stuff is the, the kind of the spiritual underpinning um, and, and sort of this, this outlook uh, about the world, which is going to be very similar and very consistent, there aren't going to be any dogs or race cars in this next book. So, uh, but uh, I don't think that's, 
I, I have to do what I, no offense, I, I got to do what I got to do. I, I, there's a lot of, there was a lot of push to try and get me to write another dog book, let me tell you that. Um, but I don't feel that's, maybe if one day a dog, it comes calling, great. But I really think that, that it's, it's my job to, to f be true to what I want to do, as long as it's good. Okay, uh, two more, two last questions. You, f okay. you first. I love the book. The ending, how long did that take? I never cry in a book, never. I bawled like a baby. Which part of the ending? The, the when he's dying. And okay. So when I first wrote the book, the ending, the book ended with, when I first started sending it out to agents and stuff, it ended with Enzo running off into the golden fields. And that was it. The, there was no epilogue. Oh. Uh, it just, Enzo ran off. It was very touching. Yes. Uh -huh. and, uh, and I sent it out to all these agents and no one, no one would, would take it. And I was getting very frustrated by this. And I thought, I, I was, God, why on earth won't anyone take this? And I, I thought, geez, you know, maybe it's because uh, people just don't buy the idea that a dog can have human thoughts, right? Maybe that's a problem with that, conceptually speaking. So what if I, what if Enzo's already dead? What if he's already dead and he's, in, he's narrating from doggy heaven and he's telling us the story of his life as he's waiting online for his new human soul? Right? That would work because no one could tell me a doggy angel cannot have human thoughts. It's just, I, you can't tell me that because you have no authority to say that. I can make it whatever I want. So I said, okay, okay. So if I do that, then how would it end? Well, if he's waiting online for his human soul, it has to end with him coming back as a person. I said, all right, so what would the last chapter be? Oh, how about this little kid and this race? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wrote that, the epilogue, and I put it on there, and I thought, yeah, that's actually, I kind of like that. I kind of like that. I said, so I went back to the beginning of the book and I started rewriting from the from chapter one. I started rewriting it from the point of view of Doggy Heaven, and uh, it was it sucked. It was horrible, absolutely terrible. And I said, I, I, I'm not doing it. I, screw this. I'm just I'm going to tell it the way I need to tell it, and I'm just going to find somebody who's going to going to help me do it. Um, but I kind of like that ending, so I'm going to keep that epilogue. So that's how the epilogue uh, ended up getting stuck on there. I've gone way over, so I'm going to go stand, sit in the back. And I'd be happy to uh, sign for any of you guys if you'd like. Thank you so much for having me here.